Culinary Tech Policy Research and Engagement. Welcome to the 14th year of the Citrus Research Exchange. Uh, we've had a host of remarkable speakers at the Citrus Research Exchange over those years, mostly in person at Sutarchadaya Hall. So we're happy to have you joining us virtually as we've trans transitioned to being online. Before we begin the talk, I'd like to first highlight a few upcoming Citrus events. The next Citrus Research Exchange will be held on Wednesday, September 28th from 12 to 1 p.m. for a discussion on greater than the sum of their parts, deceiving assumptions and analyzing complex human environment systems with Kavi Madani, head of Nexus Research Program at United Nations University. Please be sure to check out the Citrus webpage for registration details and further updates. A bit of housekeeping before we begin, please post all of your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. You should see a Q&A bar at the bottom of your window. Clicking the thumbs up on a question will help bring it to the top of the Q&A window. Questions will be addressed at the end of the talk. Today, we are joined by Allison Post. Allison Post holds the Traverse Family Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Chair of Political Science and is Associate Professor of Global Metropolitan Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research examines urban politics and policy and other political economy themes, including public service delivery, regulation, and business government relations. She also collaborates with engineers, urban planners, and scholars of public health on research on infrastructure management and smart city technology adoption. She works principally in Latin America and recently in India and the United States. She's a former president of the Urban and Local Politics Section of the American Political Science Association and former co-director of the Global Metropolitan Studies Program at UC Berkeley. It is my great honor to welcome Allison Post. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Brandy, for the kind introduction. Um, let me pull up my slides here so that everyone can see them. Okay, does that work? Can folks see my slides? Yes, beautiful. Okay, excellent. Um, so let me start off by thanking Brandy and thanking Citrus for the kind um, invitation to present our work today. Um, and here I'm actually presenting work that is not just my own, but it's part of a broader team of uh, folks spanning a variety of different fields, including one computer scientist. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that this project was funded through the California State Senate Bill 1 program, which is administered by the Institute for Transportation Studies on campus and the Global Metropolitan Studies program. And so broadly speaking, what I'm going to be talking about today is the circumstances under which local governments uh, tend to improve transparency through the use of new technologies. And this is really an illustration of uh, the sort of analysis that it's possible to do through um, using the type of data that we've been collecting through um, a, an initiative to monitor smart city technology adoption in California. Okay, so in this presentation, I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to start off a bit, uh, start off with a bit of a description about the broader project that this is a part of our effort to track the adoption of smart city technologies in California. Then I'm going to move into an illustration of the sort of analyses that one can conduct doing our using our data. Um, and this illustration is going to focus in particular on the publishing or the publication of online transit schedule information, uh, otherwise known as GTFS. And then I'll conclude by stepping back and talking a bit about what we've been learning more broadly through this project about local technology adoption by local public agencies, including the sort of rationales that uh, prompt local governments to adopt new technologies and barriers to adoption that we see. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with this first piece. What is this uh, larger data collection effort? Um, what we've been doing is engaged in an effort to monitor the adoption of smart city technologies for a comprehensive set of local jurisdictions in the state of California. Um, and here I have a picture of the landing page for our website where you can browse and see the data that we've collected thus far. Um, thus far, what we've, do, we've been doing is, is uh, tracking the adoption of new technologies um, among local uh, police agencies. So we're looking at policing and security. We're also looking at technologies related to public transit, transportation technologies, and water and sanitation. 
Um, our focus thus far has primarily been on technologies that are public facing and that they're visible from the outside. They're visible on the web, although we're beginning to look at some technologies using other techniques that uh, essentially are aimed at um, improving the internal operations of local public agencies. So this spans technologies like video surveillance and body-worn cameras that we might see used um, by policing agencies to micromobility, online transit schedules in, in the transit sector, uh, to smart metering, et cetera, in the water sector. Um, and uh, essentially this project was motivated by an ambivalence regarding the adoption of technologies. I have colleagues, for example, in civil engineering that observe um, a very pronounced hesitancy among local public agencies to adopt new technologies that might, for example, help them improve conservation efforts, help them improve uh, the, you know, the efficiency of the money that they're spending on uh, renovating pipes, these sort of things. Um, and uh, so these are, you know, often win-wins when we think about, you know, what, what we might be able to get out of, out of these investments. But other cases are much more, um, much less clear. Right, so legal scholars have really have um, raised a lot of concerns about surveillance technologies that often fall under this smart city uh, technology umbrella. Right, so our contribution to these um, to this field is really to say let's provide um, some basic information on who's adopted what, so that regardless of your position about whether or not you think the use of these technologies is good or bad that you know, we all have the same facts at our disposal about you know, to what extent uh, technologies have proliferated. So to this aim, what we've done is sort of within each of these substantive areas, we've identified a range of technologies in terms of their levels of penetration and the sort of functions that they serve. And we've been tracking each of these. So what type of data collection strategies we've used? Um, a variety thus far. We started out with web scraping, so harvesting from websites and with apps, uh, from apps, uh, information about who is actually using the different services. So one example we have here is Nixel, which is, um, uh, it's the parent company that that operates uh, the emergency and security alerts that we get on the Berkeley campus, you know, when something's happening on campus, but it's used by many, many police departments and local governments throughout the country. Um, so that's been the main one of the main sources. We've also uh, worked with existing data sets. So exam for example, the Atlas of Surveillance, which has been put together by the Electronic Freedom Foundation, has been monitoring a variety of different policing technologies over time and their adoption by local public agencies. And most recently, we have started surveying local public agencies in the state. We just ran a big survey with uh, California transit agencies in the state um, to help get at some of these technologies that are not visible on the web and sort of the, you know, as well as kind of the rationales that are expressed for adopting particular technologies. So the data we've um, compiled thus far, you can browse it, you can download it um, at our website. Um, and here um, I'm showing some of the ways that we've um, uh, incorporated in the website for users to really interact with the data and, and look for patterns that may be of interest to them. So this is um, our map display of policing technology adoption in the state. And this is a, a kind of standard GIS uh, display where you can choose how many technologies you're interested in looking at. Um, here we have a color scale where a darker color indicates that more of these technologies have been adopted, but you can also look at a single one. You can click into the data frame and see exactly which policing agency we're talking about, which technology we're talking about, et cetera. Um, so this allows one to really discern geographic patterns um, and overall patterns, just looking at the map for different parts of California. We also have um, uh, a dashboard that allows you look, to look at correlations um, with factors that we might expect to be associated with the adoption of particular types of technologies. So here is um, here are some displays from our dashboard um, for these security alerts from Nixel. Um, and here we can see essentially the correlation with the income level of the jurisdiction, uh, the policing jurisdiction in terms of who's adopted it. And we can see that, you know, medium income, 
uh, areas where the median income is kind of at the middle of the scale in California are more likely to have these emergency and security alerts. We can also look at the correlation with the crime rate, right? So we can see that it's actually not the highest crime areas that have adopted it, but rather kind of middle of the road agencies in terms of the levels of crime uh, that they see. So I encourage you to go out, play with, play with the website, look at patterns that may interest you and look at technologies that may interest you. Um, so now I'm going to move on to an illustration of what one can do with this data um, if one were to download it and play with it. Um, and uh, I'm sort of coming at this as a social scientist, as a political scientist. And so that's the analytic lens that, that we bring to analyzing this data. And the test case I'm going to show you today is focused on technologies where the aim is to improve government transparency. Um, we can, if we step back, we know that there's been a broader trend towards transparency reforms in governments more broadly. Um, last several decades have witnessed the passage of sunshine laws, freedom of information acts, et cetera. Um, these types of policies have proliferated pretty broadly, um, at least within democratic regimes. And there's a large social science literature that tries to understand the circumstances under which they proliferated. We can think about uh, a new wave of these types of reforms that has been enabled by the um, advent of ICT technologies and the popularization of web portals for local governments. Um, we have, for example, you know, the diffusion of, of open data portals, uh, online complaint registries, data displays on local problems like, like crime, et cetera, um, the publication of government accounts and financial information, et cetera. So a wide variety of, of new types of, uh, of uh, essentially uh, transparency reforms that involve uh, the introduction of new technologies. Um, and many of these are adopted by local governments, right? So here we have some examples of the open data portal from Louisville, a pothole uh, reporting um, web interface from a small town in New Mexico. Um, and, you know, overall, we're, we're seeing more and more of this. And one indication of this is the amount of investment that's occurring or is projected to occur in smart city technologies um, from consultants like Frost and Sullivan. So this figure over 300 billion includes, you know, not just transparency uh, enhancing technologies, but gives us a sense of kind of the, the growing size of, of this phenomena. So we do a case study to kind of understand the circumstances under which local governments uh, adopt transparency enhancing technologies. And this is kind of a standard social science approach where we kind of look at, at variation in the real world, in this case, you know, variation in terms of whether or not local jurisdictions are adopting the technology and try to understand what's driving that variation. How can we explain uh, when local governments choose to adopt and when they don't? Um, so this is probably a different sort of approach than you typically see in a, a citrus seminar, but it's uh, a standard sort of research question for a political scientist or a social scientist. Um, as a political scientist, it's natural for uh, one to turn to local government institutional structure as a potential explanation for this type of variation. And this is one of the hypotheses um, that we're gonna look at in our study. Um, we're also gonna look at a variety of other potential explanations for variation that we observe. Our empirical focus is going to be on one of these technologies that we've been monitoring, which is the publication of GTFS data, which are online um, public transit schedules in a format that can be easily integrated into Google Maps and other apps for, for navigating public transit. To preview what we find, and I'll go into more of this as we move on, what we find is that special districts, which are special purpose governments typically focused on one particular uh, sector or type of service, adopted GTFS earlier, and they tend to use it more often than general purpose governments like cities or counties. We also find when we look at the characteristics of the service areas of these different local governments that agency, agencies that are serving more affluent uh, populations, um, as well as younger residents are more likely to use GTFS frequently once they've adopted it. Um, 
So um, let me now dive into the meat of the study. So what I'm gonna walk through um, in, in talking about our study is first, I'm gonna give you a sense of the related work that we're drawing on and how we're building on that. Then I'll introduce our theoretical framework, the hypotheses, our working hypotheses that we're gonna test using the data. Um, then I will talk about the research design for our study, um, explain the data analysis and our results, and then step back and talk about what we can learn from the data analysis. Okay, so uh, we are drawing on existing scholarship in terms of developing um, hypotheses that we might test in this project. And there are a few relevant literatures that we can draw on for intuitions. First, there is a pretty big body of work in political science and political and, and public administration, which is trying to understand the circumstances under which governments choose to become more transparent through adopting sunshine laws or, um, or technology like open data portals. Um, and broadly speaking, what we learned from this literature, which is looking at national government efforts, um, or at least this is where the literature started, is that regime type really matters. So whether or not there's a democracy in place and then within democracies, levels of political competition matter that um, essentially um, competition means that you're more subject to kind of voter pressures to adopt trans transparency reforms. It also means that if you envision the possibility of having to leave office, that you're um, interested in knowing what's going on in, inside government after you leave, right? So through either of these mechanisms, um, this, this leads to the adoption of transparency reforms. Um, if we look at the literature that's looking at local government adoption of reforms, including transparency enhancing technologies, um, there are mixed, mixed findings with respect to competition, but there's also an emphasis on resource availability and the, the presence of a strong civil society. There's a related body of work in urban studies and geography, which uh, that's focused on the adoption of smart city technologies that also finds resource availability to be important, um, being at the center of a metropolitan area, a great urban location to be important, and centralized leadership. We can also turn to a body of work that is particularly relevant for those of us thinking about local level political processes, um, which speaks to the incentives for those that are uh, leading or working within different types of local governments uh, based on their institutional structure. If we look at a state like California, municipalities are not, cities are not the only entities delivering services. There are actually a range of different types of governments, including what are called special districts or special purpose governments. And here we have some examples on this slide. Um, there are water districts that have been formed to deliver water services. We have fire districts, particularly in unincorporated areas, areas where we don't actually have city governments in place in, um, uh, within, within counties, particularly more rural areas. There are soil conservation districts like we have here. Um, so, you know, uh, we have these very different types of, of local governments. Um, special districts are actually independent from the cities if, in which they operate. If they do operate within municipal boundaries, they have the ability to tax, to collect fees, to build and manage infrastructure, et cetera. And they tend just as in these examples here, to focus on a single policy area. And we can see why this is a very different, um, sets up a very different type of incentives than if you were uh, sort of operating a, um, a city or a county government. So um, the scholarship that we have on special districts generally argues that they are less responsive than general purpose governments. And here, the rationale is really on the, um, uh, the, the, the much lower levels of voter attention on what's actually happening within special districts. Uh, scholars argue that they're not monitored terribly well by citizens. There are extremely low rates of turnout in the elections to special districts boards, typically between two and 5%. In some cases, the boards are run by appointees rather than by elected representatives even. Um, in places where there are elections, board candidates often run unopposed, et cetera. So very low levels of public monitoring and hence low levels of responsiveness, or at least this is the characterization that emerges from much of the existing scholarship. 
There, there is a more recent wave of work, um, in particular looking at water districts, um, that suggests that special districts may be more responsive under some circumstances, particularly when issues are particularly salient on the public agenda. So what we do is build on these two bodies of literature, the literature on transparency and the literature on different institutional structures and the incentives is produced to kind of set up two competing uh, hypotheses that we're gonna evaluate using this GTFS data. The first is that um, uh, on the one hand, we can think about an argument that emphasizes the importance of voter or group pressure on these agencies and how that might vary depending on the type of local government structure that is uh, uh, in place. So we can think about uh, public agencies adopting transparency uh, enhancing technologies in response to pressure from voters and civil society. And that um, if this is what is going on, it's actually that cities and county governments, um, which receive greater public scrutiny um, and pressure, um, would be more likely to adopt uh, these sorts of reforms than special districts because they're they're more visible. People are more likely to be watching what's going on. Um, and that following adoption of the technologies that these multi these general purpose governments, city and county governments would face greater pressures to actually update and use the technologies. Um, so the overall prediction that emerges from this line of argument is that we should see, cities and counties, general purpose governments adopting these types of transparency and enhancing technologies earlier and using them more. One could, one can, however, um, draw on the literature and come up with an alternative prediction that's really focusing on how organizational resources vary between these two types of institutions. Um, we could argue that perhaps special districts are better placed to adopt transparency and enhancing technologies, but, but explicitly because of their sectoral focus. Um, they have a clear area in which um, they have to focus their efforts to please the public. It's easier, you know, people know that they're going to blame BART for, for, you know, BART problems, for example, whereas the city government is doing lots and lots of different things. Um, leaders and staff tend to be subject matter experts or are more likely to be subject matter experts and attending specialized conferences where they may learn about new types of transparency technologies that are specific to their sectors. And they may see the benefit of attracting new users as a means of increasing fee revenue um, through the adoption of these types of technologies. Um, in addition, um, you know, as kind of an ancillary hypothesis, we could think about the fact that leaders of special districts in major urban areas would be particularly well in integrated into these professional networks. So the prediction that comes out of kind of this line of thinking is that special districts may in fact adopt new technology earlier, transparency related technology earlier, and use it more often. So two competing hypotheses. Okay, so to test these hypotheses, what we do is turn to this GTFS data that I mentioned. This is GTFS is short for general transit feed specification uh, data. Um, and we're looking at publication of this data within the state of California. Um, what this is, is data that is um, essentially scheduling data that includes um, maps of routes, stops, and service times in a consistent format that was developed um, uh, in, in concert with Google. And I have a picture of what this data looks like, um, or at least what some of the output looks like here and make it a bit more concrete. Um, and um, we have uh, managed to web scrape this for a comprehensive set of, of jurisdictions in California, at least sensing whether or not uh, they're, they're publishing it. Um, and the frequency with which the, um, the schedules, these online scheduling information is updated. Um, so the agencies publish the data and then Google Maps and other apps like the transit app then integrate the data um, into their uh, respective apps. Um, and in um, our, our analysis here, we're focused on the static version of this, the kind of scheduling information that they publish. Um, and I, I wanna emphasize that this is a relative, this is relatively low hanging fruit for transit agencies in terms of, tran in terms of transparency technologies. Um, it's, it's much cheaper to do this than many other things you can imagine doing. Um, and uh, California is also a particularly informative setting in which to examine variation in rates of adoption here because 
um, uh, you have a variety of different types of transit providers in terms of their institutional structure. There are a lot of city and county governments that operate local bus services, train services, et cetera. But then we also have special districts. BART, AC Transit are examples of that. And you also have special districts operating transit um, outside the major urban areas as well. California is also an informative setting in which to look at this because there is a large amount of demographic and socioeconomic diversity in the state. Um, and this is going to allow us to assess um, with respect to usage in particular and updating um, whether or not there's a difference in terms of who's receiving more up-to-date information. Okay, so you may ask how exactly is GTFS improving transparency? Let me walk you through a few ways in which it does. Um, the first is that it makes the menu of available transit services much clearer to the public. Um, so before GTFS, um, I might have had to go to different agencies, collect PDFs or even paper copies of the schedules, you know, do a bunch of calculations to figure out what's the you know, easiest way for me to get from point A to point B. Now it's on our phone, we can compare different options, figure out what makes the most sense. Um, so it makes the actual menu of services available. It, can, it also makes it much easier than previously to, to understand inequities in service coverage. So I can, for example, look at whether if someone living in neighborhood A or neighborhood B, um, which may be equidistant as the crow flies from a particular employer, I can look at how much longer it takes them to travel, what the wait times are, comparative wait times are for individuals living perhaps in a more low income or more high income area. Um, whereas beforehand, you know, looking at these paper maps, it would have been really quite difficult and labor intensive to figure that out. It also just makes public transit easier to use. Um, and this is particularly important when schedules change. And we have a very nice example of this, I won't say nice, but we have a, a stark example of this during the pandemic, right? When ridership plummeted and the transit, uh, the transit agencies really had to adjust and figure out how they were gonna square helping frontline workers get to their jobs with uh, you know, the plummeting revenues from, from ridership. Um, and then a final point uh, is that uh, we, in our survey of local public transit agencies that I mentioned um, previously, and I'll, I'll talk more about it um, later on, um, local public transit agencies actually mentioned trans, uh, transparency as their primary or most important reason for adopting these technologies. Okay. So GTFS, it's important to acknowledge that it, it has not always been adopted. And there's also variation in the extent to which agencies are actually updating their schedules once they've published a first version of their schedule. Um, so despite the fact that I mentioned it's, it's low cost, it's easy to publish these schedules, it's not yet available everywhere in California. In fact, 31% of agencies in California have never published their schedules using GTFS. Um, some agencies have waited a decade, among those who have adopted, some waited a decade to actually go ahead and publish. Um, and we also observe variation in terms of the extent to which the schedules are kept up to date. Um, so I mentioned that tons of schedule updating during the pandemic, yet 10% um, of the agencies that had initially put up a schedule prior to the pandemic did not update their schedules at all during the pandemic. And a number of additional ones you know, did so very, very infrequently. So, and then, you know, contrasted with some agencies that were changing their schedule every month or two, right? So um, lots of variation for us to try to understand. Um, this is just an illustration from Northern California of um, agencies that have adopted versus those that, that haven't. Um, so for the agencies that adopted, we can use the GTFS data to actually map their routes. So the blue is the adopters. And then the orange is the kind of polygon outlines of the jurisdictions that have not yet adopted. We don't know exactly where their buses run because they haven't showed their GTFS data. Okay. So what do we find in terms of patterns of adoption? Um, so I'm presenting here both raw data as well as um, data that, that comes out of survival modeling that we've done. Um, and here what we see as a pattern where essentially independent public agencies, which is how the national transit database categorizes these special district providers. Um, 
uh, that they were the first ones to adopt. Um, they uh, came out earlier and here we can see it actually on the graph with the darker line here, right? That they essentially adopted earlier and got to kind of a level of almost complete adoption well above 75% by um, the end of a time period what we're, that we were looking at with this, which is 2021. Um, local governments, and here this is a term encompassing cities and counties that were operating transit agencies, um, they were slower to adopt, um, but have been catching up. And actually, if you were to just run um, a regression right now and look at whether or not, you know, having published GTFS um, in 2021 is explained by whether or not you're a special district or a um, or a, a, a city or county, um, it would be statistically indistinguishable. Um, but what we do see in the models is this pattern of kind of these special districts being earlier to adopt uh, than others. And the other category is, is here is for tribal agencies and other types of agencies that don't fit in either of these two categories. Okay, so what do we see then in terms of patterns of updating? Um, so in terms of usage of the technology, and here what we're referring to is um, publishing new schedules as they become available and as you know schedules change, um, we have a different set of patterns that emerge. Um, we chose to look at this uh, in a period that encompassed the pandemic because we knew this was a time period during which schedules were changing pretty rapidly. Um, almost all agencies saw some sort of major dip in terms of ridership. Um, and so we can interpret in this, we can reasonably interpret this time period a failure to update your GTFS schedules as a failure to really kind of you know, make use of the technology to kind of utilize it um, and, and, and make use of its potential. So what we did was analyze um, uh, the number, the average number of quarterly updates by agencies, by agency type, um, as well as uh, a number of other characteristics within a regression framework. And I, I have the, the raw data, however, up here for to show folks what, what we saw. Basically, what we see here is there's still, at least in the raw data, independent update agencies were updating more frequently. Um, however, when you control for a number of other factors, um, that difference is not always statistically distinguishable. So it does appear that kind of the main hurdle um, is, is actually getting these uh, general purpose governments, these city county, counties to adopt the technology in the first place. But once they adopt, they're actually using it um, reasonably frequently. What we do see is a difference in activity levels or usage rates between principal cities, which are the kind of primary cities within a given metropolitan area, and smaller cities, small rural cities, and suburban cities, that essentially it's these agencies servicing primary cities um, that are principal cities, I should say, that are utilizing it much more frequently. Um, okay. Now, we were also concerned with disparities in access. So, okay, we have these patterns of, of updating. What does that mean in terms of uh, the access of different types of groups to updated schedules, to kind of accurate scheduling information? So here, what we did was try to characterize the transit agency service areas. Um, and here we had to do this for areas that had adopted GTFS because that's where we had the route maps to work with. Um, in terms of the extent to which they were comprised of different groups, including um, marginalized groups. And then we analyzed whether or not GTFS publication rates were lower for agencies um, with uh, a greater prevalence of, of low-income groups and other marginalized groups. And we worked with demographic data from the American Communities Survey, um, and essentially where we could get at information about population composition at the census block group level. And we were looking at median income, um, race, unemployment, et cetera. Um, and actually let me back up and say, it's, it's not a given that high income communities would necessarily receive um, better service, sort of more, more um, updating, because lower income communities are actually more likely to use public transit. So it could be that you effectively had a strong enough lobby in low income areas to, to push for up-to-date scheduling information. 
or alternatively, kind of thinking to the literature and political participation and political science, we do know empirically that higher income groups are more likely to participate politically and to complain about things that they want changed by local government. So you could kind of come at, you could have two kind of contrary expectations about what we might find. So what we did to kind of uh, characterize these service areas is to start with uh, the transit routes, which we were able to map using GTFS for each local agency. And here we have different colors, different agencies. Um, and I think you may recognize blue is AC Transit, yellow is BART, um, purple is Amtrak, and then we have uh, Orinda Moraga uh, Transit Agency over on the right in red. Um, we created a buffer around these, around the stops, um, smaller buffers for bus, larger ones for rail. Um, and then we superimpose the buffers over census block group boundaries. Um, and then what we did was use ArcGIS to determine the percentage of, of each block group lying within each stop buffer, and then essentially summed over these different areas to kind of characterize the, the overall composition of the, um, of, the, of the groups of the population that each transit agency was serving using a, a variety of different techniques. I'm happy to send a copy of our paper, which has a long appendix that uh, explains how we did this for anyone who's curious. Okay, so what did we find when we did this analysis? Um, essentially, you know, when we when we um, examine this within a regression framework using a variety of different modeling strategies, what we found is that agencies servicing populations with higher median incomes and those located in metro centers updated their schedules much more frequently during this this period that encompassed the pandemic. Um, we also found that agencies serving populations with higher medium ages updated their schedules less frequently. So the bias is towards younger and higher median income. Contrary to what we thought could be happening, we didn't observe race to be playing a dynamic at all. It seems to be that the main differences were in terms of income levels. Okay. Um, so just to back up and describe what we take away from the study of the GTFS data that we collected as part of this broader project, we find that these special district governments, the kind of single sector uh, service providers um, were more likely to adopt GTFS earlier, um, as were agencies located within kind of the central parts of urban areas. Um, and this provides, out of those two competing hypotheses that I laid out, suggests that spe specialization, policy specialization, appears to provide certain advantages and that we should be really delving into these organizational dynamics in terms of understanding who adopts these transparency enhancing technologies earlier rather than later. Um, in terms of, you know, we, we delved into a bit of press coverage also about um, covering the kind of deliberations about adoption. And here, one of the things that came out was that these large metropolitan agencies that may have adopted G or typically adopted GTFS earlier were often spurring adoption in surrounding areas later so that others could kind of harmonize schedules with them as well. So this really stepping back, it suggests that if we're going to understand the politics of technology adoption related to transparency, we really need to focus on these bureau on bureaucratic politics and what's kind of going on between and within agencies, rather than focusing on voter pressures, or at least this is what the GTFS data is suggesting. Um, what also comes out are these equity implications that agencies serving lower income populations that need transit more are actually less likely to be updating their schedules and providing, you know, accurate scheduling information to the public. Okay, so that's what we've learned from this one type of data, and I'm hoping this is an incentive to many of you to kind of go in and dig uh, around and see what we can learn from some of the other types of data that we've posted as part of this project. Um, so let me now move on to, to a little bit of discussion about what may be driving these results that we see. Um, and here we're able to draw on a survey that we um, fielded this spring in collaboration with Caltrans, the California Department of Transportation. Um, it was sent out to all of the transit agencies in the state, um, and we you know, had a reasonable re number of agencies responding, 63. Um, and one of the things we asked them about is not only whether or not they had adopted 
real-time transit data, whether they had started publishing this type of data, um, but also why they had done it. Um, and here, what came out is that um, essentially transparency and public relations were the primary reasons cited for adopting it. Like over 90% of agencies put this as their first choice. Um, the second choice, your second rationale that they focused on was improving user experience and safety. So interestingly, what we're seeing in this data is essentially that these special districts that one could argue, you know, they're more insular, they're less, you know, kind of under the pressure of, of, of voters and interest groups. But in fact, what we're seeing is that these agencies are very, you know, at least in terms of how they describe their behavior, right, that they're focusing on transparency and public relations. Um, so this is suggesting that special agencies or special purpose districts are really kind of thinking quite proactively about public relations and these transparency enhancing technologies are, are kind of one way in which they can um, improve their public relations. Okay, let's see if I have time, yes. Okay, so stepping back and kind of thinking about this study alongside some of the other work that we're doing, um, how can we think about the circumstances under which local um, public agencies adopt new technologies. Um, we've clearly been talking about one type of case here, transparency and enhancing technologies. Um, these are often lower cost than many of the other types of technologies that local governments or infrastructure agencies may choose to adopt. These are ones that the public is generally supportive of, even if they're not initiating the call for it. Um, there's no real risk to the kind of core mission or service in many cases, you know, publishing GTFS isn't going to prevent the bus drivers from, you know, uh, actually doing their job as they you know, maneuver the buses through the urban fabric. Um, the main barrier may be just hesitancy about bad press in these areas, right? Um, unless we're talking about, about transparency enhancing technologies that also um, uh, move over into the area of surveillance. And that's a, that's another, another topic. More, more broadly, and we've been interviewing in water agencies as well as in um, other sectors, um, what's come out of the, particularly the qualitative work that we've done in this area is that um, agencies are really um, very risk averse, very conservative with respect to new technology because they're concerned about risks to their reputations. Um, if in any way adopting a new technology, even if it's just on a fluke, could result in you know, some sort of environmental violation, some sort of service disruption, um, that they could take a big reputational hit from that. And so they're very, very conservative under those circumstances. They're also concerned about justifying their costs to the public. So low cost technologies are gonna be easier for them to justify than higher cost ones. And so GTFS is kind of in this, you know, early easier to adopt category in that respect. A second consideration that comes out is that um, the, the workforce of these agencies can be an important lobby against new types of technologies, especially when it can, consists of a new burden and involves rewriting job descriptions, et cetera. So again, GTFS is an example of, you know, one that doesn't, you know, wouldn't necessarily imply that except for the people who actually, you know, are involved in publishing the feeds. The bus driver's work is likely not going to be redefined because they're publishing the schedules online. Um, but we can imagine technologies that that do have that, right, um, that do really impose a burden on, um, you know, members of the workforce that could then uh, serve as a lobby against adoption. Um, and then finally, um, public agencies are very concerned about lock-in with, particularly with new technologies, with specific vendors that may come and go, right? It's, it's one thing to publish kind of open source data that Google and other entities can integrate into their, um, into their applications, but it's something else to kind of buy a proprietary system from, you know, a, a vendor that may go away. And we can think about examples like ShotSpot or very expensive system, just a few providers, very consolidated market, right? This is, I should mention, it's a gunshot detection system um, that, that a number of, of large police agencies have adopted. Um, so clearly there's gonna be a lot of variation across technologies in terms of the, the way in which local governments are making decisions about adoption or not. And so I've talked about a specific case here, one of these transparency and enhancing technologies, but if we were to expand our scope and think about 
other types of technologies, we would need to take some of these other considerations into account. So with that, I would like to thank everyone, first of all, Citrus for inviting me to come share our research, um, to our funders for this project, um, as well as to a number of colleagues for advice and assistance with the project. So thanks very much. And I will click out of, um, let's see if I can click out of, there we go. Great. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Allison. This was incredibly eye-opening. I'm going to kick us off with a few questions. I see that some people have already put some questions in the chat. I encourage you all to also put some questions in the Q&A box. Sorry for that mistake there, but please put it in the Q&A box. Um, I found this work very interesting around how it actually supports greater transparency and accountability. And what really stood out to me was how it can actually map inequality in service provision. And I just would like to see, have you seen any examples of where access to this data and these user interfaces and showing where there is disproportionate access has actually led to change? So that's a, that's a great question, Brandy. I think, you know, I think we're actually at the beginning of the period during which this data is now becoming more generally available. And it's type, it's through these types of research efforts and efforts like what the Electronic Freedom Foundation is doing with policing data, for example, that these kind of patterns of, of unequal adoption or use are becoming much more visible and more transparent. And so that I think the next generation of activism may be people now looking at this data and it's you know it's it's more visible now and it's out there in maps right you can see who's who's doing what in a way that previously wasn't visible you may hear what's going on in a neighboring jurisdiction but i think having the data out there in in map form is potentially going to change the equation both for those who want to encourage technology adoption as well as for those who are concerned about it and i think in the policing arena you know we have organizations that are quite concerned about a number of these policing technologies and, and may start drawing on this, this data for those reasons. Yeah, thank you. And I was really happy to see that transparency was that number one reason for why these special districts are deploying these technologies, uh, because without transparency, we can't have accountability. I want to get a little bit more into these special districts here in a moment, but I see a question in the chat from Marcy. I'm going to butcher your last name, Haffy. Federal Transit Administration has not yet mandated GTFS. They may require this in the next year or two, so that may help. Should the agency have the right to ignore this low-cost solution publishing GTFS? I see. So I'm just following up on, on Marcy's um, written version here. Um, I think the key is actually providing assistance. So we could imagine that a rural transit agency doesn't necessarily have a dedicated IT person that could devote a lot of time to getting this up and running. And even though in comparative terms, this is a low cost transparency enhancing technology that one could consider, that doesn't mean that every agency has the bandwidth. And so one thing that the, the state of California has actually been um, through, through Caltrans and through a, a kind of joint effort, this Cal ITP, program has been working on trying to encourage and provide assistance to agencies that are trying to do this. And so I think that that's key when we look at these inequities is to kind of use this as a starting point for thinking about what are the barriers, um, particularly if it's a technology where you know, there aren't important downsides or at least the downsides are very few that we should be considering that having assistance, technical assistance in place is, is, is very, very important. We did not ask about um, whether or not they knew about um, the tools from the National Rural Transit Assistance Program in our survey. We were looking at a wide set of technologies and could only you know, take 10 minutes of, of people's time. So, um, but that, that would have been an interesting thing to have included. Yeah. And again, we encourage everybody to please put questions in the Q&A box. And the, your response to that question ties back nicely to my question on special districts. And I'm wondering, it seems like there are some characteristics of cer certain special districts that make them more likely to be able to adopt and implement these technologies. For example, they might have the data already available to them. Um, so could you talk a little bit about these other entities that might not have the data readily available? I imagine that there could be some partnerships with other public agencies or departments or even the private sector. 
So in the case of GTFS um, and the static GTFS that we're analyzing here, this is just the schedule information. So it's actually something that every agency would have. You know, they have line, bus line one, two, three. They stop first here, the first here, first here, and here are the you know times when they're supposed to stop at each location. So it's about taking those paper schedules and converting it into that electronic format that they can share. So there is a kind of cost of doing it, but it's something that every transit agency would have, regardless of whether or not that transit agency was housed in a city government or whether it was a legally independent entity, right? Um, so we could think about other types of transparency enhancing technologies, however, where that data wouldn't necessarily be already available in-house. And there we might wanna ask whether you know, again, participating in these sort of more specialized professional networks and the way that special district employees may be more likely to do would kind of facilitate knowledge about how to, you know, efficiently um, amass that technology, et cetera. Um, we did look at um, resources available to these agencies in, in the modeling that we were doing and, and also agency size, right? So, um, you know, you one could reasonably expect, for example, uh, AC Transit or BART, one of these large uh, areas that service a large fraction of a metropolitan area to be better placed to adopt simply because they're larger agencies, they have more people, they could have dedicated IT people. Um, we do see that size is a predictor of adoption, but even at a given level of, um, at a given agency size, the special districts were more likely to adopt earlier. Yeah, I actually have a question on that about the staffing and bringing on people with that tech expertise. Did you see that those special districts that are able to adopt this technology, did you have dedicated IT staff? And also, does it run younger? I wonder, like, are they hiring these people yeah. who are recent grads who are just excited right. about developing these forward-facing technologies? So we we don't have disaggregated data on that. That would be fascinating to collect. Um, I think one can probably assume that the more employees an agency has, the more likely that they would have a dedicated staff member that could work on IT issues. So, but and so we take size as kind of agency size as kind of our best proxy for that. Yeah, and, and I'm actually curious how we might be able to tie this in with some of the data governance, AI governance space. Because mm -hmm. I imagine as we start to use these data sets and we're building machine learning models on top, how might this push toward transparency in the data at this stage actually lead to better governance and public accountability down the road for additional applications built on top? Are you, are you asking about this particular type of technology? Yes, actually, I think that would be interesting if they are thinking about building any mm -hmm. machine learning um, applications on top of that data. But are there other examples that you have? Well, I'm, let me start with with GTFS. I mean, there, there are two types of GTFS data. There's just the static scheduling information, and then there's real-time information that gets at the actual location of the transit vehicles, and that's where you can get more precise estimates of kind of how long you have to wait for the next bus, et cetera. It does strike me that, um, you know, in terms of mining the data using machine learning, that real-time data could be potentially quite useful in terms of thinking about optimization, thinking about, you know, how to maybe tweak routes so that you're avoiding traffic block, you know, traffic buildups, et cetera. I mean, it strikes me that there's a lot of potentially really quite helpful uses for that sort of data. Um, we might alternatively worry a bit about, you know, the extent to which having real-time data available on actual public transit locations poses a, a public security risk potentially. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, you know, there are trade-offs, right? People need to know how they're gonna get from point A to point B. Yeah, of course, yeah. And also I have a question about documentation of these, um, the allocation of this and who is served. And I wonder if we're also documenting the benefits and risks. You sort of hinted at some of the potential risks around cybersecurity issues or, or privacy issues. Is there a mechanism in place at, at all at this stage for documenting benefits and risks of deploying these transparency enhancing technologies? Well, I think we're seeing variation across sectors and across technologies here. Brandy, I know you've been doing some work in the policing sphere, but we have seen 
efforts by local governments and the ACLU has been working at the state level to kind of try to monitor and provide some parameters on the use of, of uh, technologies that involve surveillance in some form or another, right? So I think, you know, there are reasons to be more concerned about establishing a, a strong regulatory apparatus and monitoring for some of these technologies than, than others. And it's been great to see actually, you know, a lot of, of creative and very helpful thinking and policy mobilization um, over time. And it does seem like California is, is a little bit out ahead on these issues relative to um, many other states in terms of thinking these issues through. Yeah. And speaking of mobilization, what role do you see for the different stakeholder groups in assisting the development and use of these tools? So, for example, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what role can academia play? What role can civil society play, industry and then government mm -hmm. the groups? OK, let me make sure I've I've gotten all of them. Yeah, so academia, industry, civil society, Absolutely. industry, government. OK. Um, so this is not exhaustive, but here are some initial thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. So academia, I think, you know, on the one hand, I have colleagues in, in civil engineering, computer science, and other fields that are coming up with new ideas for new types of transparency enhancing technologies and figuring out how to actually develop those systems, right? So that's one key uh, contribution. Um, on the other hand, social scientists, what we can do is, is try to identify patterns of adoption, make them transparent and get more of these why questions. How are making governments, how are governments making decisions about whether or not to adopt? What sort of considerations do they have in mind? And we can get the data out there just like we're doing in our in our portal, right? We turn to um, civil society, I think, there, you know, as academics, it's not necessarily our role to be involved in mobilization, at least for social scientists, we try to, you know, usually you know, stay, stay neutral in these questions, but civil society groups can look at these patterns and decide if there's a reason for concern, if their community is not being served in an equitable fashion, right? Once they look at these maps and the data that has been compiled. And so they're in a great position or in a better position with the data on hand to mobilize if there's actual evidence of the disparities. So we kind of hope we're contributing in our small way mm -hmm. to that, that type of, of effort. Um, industry um, is, I think, like academics in a position to think through um, new potential technologies that could be useful in this space, um, as well as ones that they may want to um, integrate into their products. So we've seen, for example, GTFS being picked up by a number of different transit apps. We see um, Google was actually fundamental in terms of the partnership and developing the, the GTFS framework, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and government, I, I want to kind of, again, point to the state's role in terms of um, trying to support agencies that are struggling with technology adoption and facilitating information sharing between different jurisdictions, providing technical support where needed and appropriated, or to point to the example we just talked about previously, regulating if there are concerns about privacy, if there are concerns about um, potentially negative effects of adoption, that's where you know we need the state as either the state government or the cities to be regulators and to think carefully about, you know, issues like cybersecurity and privacy. Great. And thank you so much, Allison, for running through those four stakeholder groups with me. I'd like to thank you for giving this very insightful talk today and remind everybody that there will be a, um, a recording of this video made available at our YouTube site. So if you go to YouTube and just look up Citrus UC, you should be directed to our page and you can see this video posted soon. And a reminder to please join us next Wednesday, September 28th for Kaba Madani, head of Nexus Research Program at the United Nations University for a discussion on greater than the sum of their parts, deceiving assumptions and analyzing complex human environment systems. Again, thank you all for joining today and thank you, Allison, for your remarks. Thanks so much for the invitation to speak. Thank you.